Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where our purpose is to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve your organization sustainably. Learn how to achieve and sustain an excellence journey for yourself, others, and the planet. And I'm your host, Brad Jevons, coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. We are proudly brought to you in association with SA Partners, a world-leading business transformation consultancy. SA Partners are a truly purposeful company focused on helping organisations achieve sustainable improvement for themselves, others, and the planet. Welcome to episode 87 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. I'm so pleased to have one of my mentors on the show with me today, Mr. Dirk Krauss. Dirk is an expert in enterprise excellence. He's worked with our largest organisations all over the world. Today, we could talk on any topic, but we're going to hone in on strategy deployment and the senior leadership role. Dirk, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Nice to be with you. Yeah. Dirk, what's your what's your backstory, mate? What led you down this path of getting involved in lean and enterprise excellence? Hmm. Okay, well, it takes me back a few years. I started my career in automotive industry, worked for Ford Motor Company, uh, and after 10 years, uh, went to Goodyear Tires. Uh, with Goodyear, because we were busy with a massive reorganization into a matrix system. Um, I uh, ended up with postings uh, in uh, Luxembourg, where they have their head office, the European head office, and uh, the US, of course, and also in Brazil, before coming back to uh, South Africa, which is where I was based. Um, Then later on moved to the competition, which was Firestone, uh, and a few years after that, uh, Firestone was bought over by Bridgestone worldwide. Uh, the Africans, African sites were somewhat delayed. But anyway, uh, when they did, uh, they sent a whole group of uh, Japanese advisors, what we would call sensei, uh, across. These were all very senior and uh, experienced people, some of them ex-board members. So really, really uh, a fantastic group. Uh, And one of them ended up in my office, sharing an office with me, which was uh, very confronting. Uh, My office had to be enlarged. And uh, yeah, the, the, the probably the, the most uh, interesting part of it was the fact that Kenji's son, uh when he moved in in the first uh hour we were attending a meeting where we were uh giving awards to people coming uh based on our suggestion box system and in that first hour uh he just i just heard the word all the time uh bad very bad that was the phrase and uh very very confronting uh clearly he was not impressed with what we've done uh and uh yeah so it was it it started the journey so of course this was uh the striking bit however once uh, a few days later once i sat down i recorded all the things that he uh said bad very bad too I'm, I'm sure I didn't capture all of them, but it came to a number 20. But in an hour to have heard that, that really uh, shook me. Um, so I think that was uh, the start of it. Uh, it was specifically on a suggestion box system, as I mentioned. Uh, four months later, by basically just uh, working alongside him, by the way, as you know, the sensei never give any answers. They just confront you with a challenge. Um, and we noticed uh, on an audit for an uh, ISO audit, uh, somebody asked the question, one of the auditors asked the question, how many Kaizens do you guys have? There's a lot. And when we did a count, we had uh, around 350. Wow. Uh, whereas before, when we were giving... Uh, the award session, we had 26 suggestion boxes. Uh, 
So a dramatic change. And of course, uh, then I really sat up. I woke up at that stage. Well, that's the old model. They uh, work, they coach you in a Socratic style. And uh, Kenji san three years later, were followed up by uh, the previous head sensei from Europe, uh, Hiroshi Mashibiyama. Um, and uh, yeah, he did not move into my office. He said outside, but he was much more senior, in fact. And uh, yeah, him and I actually had an, an extremely excellent uh, relationship, even long after I, we both left employee. Wow. And how amazing is that to, to have like all those years of dedicated resource, just coaching and developing you like that is, that is such a foreign concept to what we see in Australia anyway, typically. Yeah. I think it's extremely humbling, humbling to realize that uh, the company could uh, expend the resources of such people uh, for such a long period of time in coaching somebody just to be a change agent. Um, that is, uh, yeah, it still, it still amazes me till today. I owe my whole career subsequently to those two gentlemen. Um, and, and, and the mere fact that uh, they never told you what to do. Yeah. Always Very questions. unusual from a Western point of view. Yeah. We, we like to tell people what to do. Uh, they challenge you. Yeah. And it's like, it's such a common story, Dirk. A lot of the experts I've had on the show that they've had years with a, a sensei from, you know, you know, like Mike was a, who came on the show, he had years with senseis out of Japan and then yourself and there's others, many others too. Like it's such, such an opportunity. And um, it's a common theme that I see of the experts I talk to around the world that they've been through that. Yeah, indeed. So. Yeah. Dirk, one question I've got, and this is heading down a path that is a topic for the show. How have you coped with that in your career where you've been helping many organizations and they've invested? I know that, you know, some have invested in you as one person or others you're in there as a single person with a few others. How have you gone knowing what you experienced at, you know, Bridgestone versus what you're having to deal with in other organizations where the maybe the investment or the time put into coaching is so much less. How have you found that and dealt with that? Yeah, it's quite varied depending on the company and the culture of the company. Uh, the one item that really stood out for me, maybe as a, as a, a key to unlocking the potential in uh, following this approach is really uh, that, so many companies that I've uh, that I've been with, uh, they embark maybe on a, some kind of a lean or operational excellence program. Uh, but when it started at a middle management level, it can just never really look. They'll make some good continuous uh, improvement uh, improvements, cost savings, improvement in quality, but it never becomes really part of the culture of the organisation. Mm. the the key is really that you have to work right at the top uh again in the case of uh, uh my experience in bridgestone um i was actually perhaps not at the top level i was not a director at the time but the ceo uh the finance director hr director the manufacturing director each had uh, a sensei sitting with them coaching wow. them and so when you start there things change dramatically you know we suddenly from a firestone to uh, a bridgestone company for the first time had directors from from the head office coming to visit the plant engaging with people on the floor and what a difference it made to the, the the whole culture uh, in the organisation it, it 
and I think that's perhaps the missing link for many organizations is that um, culture cannot be, it can be maybe tweaked at an intermediate level, but the only people that can change a culture uh, are really the top guy. Yeah. And the top guys are the ones that can do it and demonstrate it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, David uh, Mann in his book, Creating a Lean Culture, I've quoted this uh, in a recent post on LinkedIn. Um, he made, he's, he articulated extremely well uh, that uh, if the top guy starts doing things and he asks for it to be implemented, it generally gets done. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's the model that I think is probably uh, very, very important for me. Dirk, there, it's reminding me of a study done by David Rock, who was an Australian. He's a runs a neuroscience leadership organization, and I remember reading it, and he was talking about right the way to achieve culture change is to start at the top and train the trainer. Train Absolutely. them to be the expert, train them to be the trainer, and then cascade from there. So then they train the middle management, and then from there they train down below there. Is that what was going on at Bridgestone? Oh, yes, definitely. And uh, not only that, the whole Ocean Country uh, strategy planning model works on that basis. It is a very cascaded program. It starts with a vision from CEO, and then goes to... Uh, basically level by level. Uh, and there are different functions at each level uh, to be performed. So the work is not necessarily uh, all done like in a typical legacy company. We have the whole plan being developed right to the top and then through a, 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 a range of uh, town halls and, and other communication methods, posters, the information is being cascaded down to the floor. Whereas in Ocean Country, it is developed at all the levels. And every level has a different function to perform in building that up. And in between the levels and even at, the, at each level itself, there's the sketchball process, as they call it, which is really uh, a way of getting everybody to air their opinions. But the output from that is really great alignment and a focus on what really matters. You know, instead of the trivial many, you end up with a vital few in that, in the, in, in, in that process. And the alignment, not necessarily always consensus, but alignment that you have from that, is what stands out compared to uh, yeah the traditional way of doing doing business. So that's interesting, Dirk. That the two topics we're talking about today are tied at the hip in a way. That from what you've seen in best practice coming out of the a high performing Japanese company, which was Bridgestone, and I've heard similar stories in Toyota and others. The excellence journey starts with the top leadership becoming trained and highly skilled, and they become the coaches. And then also you're tying a Hoshin Kanre or strategy to deployment and cultural deployment approach to that, where the, the same process applies. They're, they're, there's that cascade and they're acting as the coach and the mentor to support everyone to put their input. But if you go traditional ways, traditional that you see in most organizations, the senior leadership are very busy and they're really quite distant from the organization or more the practical stuff, you know, they're dealing with other stuff and this, the more practical stuff about our operating system and how we operate is often seen as, I don't know if it's below them or just that's not my job and I don't deal in that. And then also strategy doesn't cascade. Strategy is a big plan that's put together at the top. Do you see that too, Dirk, or am I just in a bubble with what I see on that? No, you are spot on there. Uh, that is uh, unfortunately, I think the way that business schools uh, have developed the practice. Um, it, it is interesting when I did my, my MBA, uh, my thesis was actually on business planning. And I had to almost uh, throw all of that out of the book once I came across Ocean Country. Uh, because uh, 
the yeah, the model is often a, a very secretive business plan. It sits in the CEO's uh, vault uh, many times and gets discussed maybe at quarterly board meetings. Whereas uh, in the case of Ocean Country, it's actually out on the floor. It's posted. Everybody can see it. Apart from the fact that they contributed to it, which means they already know they have they they were able to argue against it, but it means that they are intimately involved in it. Number one, number two, it then doesn't just get discussed quarterly or monthly or whatever. It is discussed at every level in different formats. On the floor level, basically your your daily management system or your tiered accountability is some calls it, that's an outflow from the ocean. And so it gets discussed daily, shiftly. Uh, yeah, so the interaction with the plan is so, so different. And of course, the uh, with everybody being aligned from all levels, it means the CEO or the finance director can walk into a factory and talk to the items with anyone on the floor and they can talk back. That is amazing. So the, uh, yeah, camaraderie, maybe belong to uh, concepts that flow from that is just amazing. It changes morale uh, in an organization. Uh, it brings out the best in people in my view. When I was first involved in deploying enterprise excellence, I gained so much from being able to connect with global experts like Chris Butterworth, Alex Tio, and Peter Hines. They shared their knowledge, but they also inspired me to keep moving forward and played a big part in what I'm doing now. We can now offer this same opportunity to many of our listeners. We are currently forming the enterprise excellence community. This community is for people practically deploying an excellence journey within their enterprise. The community allows us to link directly with our world's experts each month to learn and grow for an hour. We already have Jeff Sutherland, Jeff Leiker, Pascal Dennis, Laurent Sommer, and Lewis Trigger confirmed for the coming months. For the final hour of the gathering, we then link in small groups with our peers to help each other overcome challenges and continue to move forward towards our vision of excellence and goals within our organization. To get involved or gain more information, reach out via our website, enterpriseexcellencepodcast.com backslash contact. We look forward to talking to you soon and working together with our world's experts and each other to create a better future. And Dirk, you know, you, you mentioned in that conversation, the cascade where, you know, senior leaders may be developing some elements and then they're checking it with everyone in the organization and making adaptions that catch ball style process and then helping down below form what it means to them. What does it look like? At, what does sort of the main focal document or plan look like at the top level, middle management, and then front line? How does that evolve and adapt as it goes down the organization? Yeah, so Ocean Gunnery, um, by the way, it was developed by Bridgestone. Uh, they actually got the Deming Prize in 1964. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Toyota and uh, Kumatsu followed in 68. Um, and uh, they actually made some further improvements as typically a continuous improvement organization would. And uh, they were in permanent contact between Toyota and, and Bridgestone on this. And even my experience when I worked for, uh, for Bridgestone, we were having very, very especially the Japanese, they had almost, they had formal meetings between them and Toyota. They had nothing to do with the business itself, but more about uh, developing the appropriate tools and mechanisms. However, coming back to your question, um, the, uh, the, the, the main, there are, so there are several documents. There's a whole bunch of forms to facilitate it. Probably the, the main one is called the x chart. So it is a chart that uh, uh, it's a bit of a confusing chart because it's very busy, but it's all about uh, very succinctly state uh, the objectives. Um, it starts from the vision. That's the objectives. 
Uh, and that's basically the role of uh, the senior exec. Uh, that then rolls over to the functional heads where they take that and uh, transform that into a st and strategies. Um, so there would be a, perhaps a quality strategy or there would be operational strategy or sales strategy, whatever the case would be. And that then rolls back to the site levels where uh, they take all of that, uh, of course, challenge some of it, uh, as did the senior, the senior f functional heads with the exec. Uh, but then they will take that and say, okay, so how do, how do we implement it? In what way can we do it? And they put those plans up. And again, in between all the time, all this catch ball process, it, it takes months. Um, the end result is then they, they get alignment. They actually test. There are tests in that uh, uh, document to make sure that nothing is uh, uh, left as an orphan and that it actually do uh, fulfill what was the initial intent all the way through. It then gets to the stage where it gets assigned into uh, a lower level for actions. And uh, so there will be different, as I said, different levels of uh, the ocean. <laughs> but the overall plan Everyone shares it, and that's what's amazing, and it's posted everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it's, so yeah, as it's, you can see, it, it really becomes more micro and detail as it goes down through the layers. You mentioned vision, objective, strategies, and then you're getting down to projects, actions. I'm guessing when you hit the front line, you know, there may be some actions, but there may also be a real some measure adaption that they're defining some measures that they need to adapt or... Evolve. Oh, yeah. So, so, of course, even at the vision stage, they, uh, the exec will, will put down their top uh, measures, KPIs, that they expect the rest of the organization, or uh, uh, well, that's what they intend we should be striving at. But then the next level also interprets that, may even tweak some of those uh, KPIs and add in a different level of that. So how do you contribute to achieve that? Maybe a composite of other KPIs. And the same happens all the way down to the floor. Yeah, I think it's um, Dirk. I, for me, I say it's the nearest thing to a silver bullet to get a continuous improvement culture. <laughs> well, I'm not so because, sure, but it's a good one. <laughs> like with, I, I love Mike Roth's work too, and you know, Mike talks about the Toyota Carter, and like, how do you get Toyota Carter going unless you do good strategy deployment? How do you help every person and team set their challenging, meaningful goals? Mm and own them and start moving towards them without first being okay at strategy deployment. It's very difficult. Although exactly. you might please rebuck me if you don't agree with that. No, 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 exactly. Thoughts. In fact, because it has such a, uh, a rigorous uh, follow-up and review, apart from your daily meetings and your, your weekly meetings that are all uh, aligned uh, into the ocean, um, the, uh, the process is such that alongside with that, you have your coaching, your Gemba coaching, for instance. Uh, and so the focus of a Gemba coach uh, would always be when, when there's an engagement with somebody on the floor would be to address some of the issues that's on, on the strategic plan on the ocean. And, uh, so everything is so alive. And, you know, the, the discipline that uh, Ocean brings, not only in, in talking about it, reviewing it, talk, you know, uh, considering uh, better approaches, uh, where, we, where are people struggling with implementing, but also the coaching side of it itself. Uh, establish such a, such a rigid uh, routine that, that it's a carter. It's a con. It's uh, just another Carter, and and uh, yeah, I think it also uh, uh, disallows funny projects to suddenly creep in. A new, uh, I mean, 
in my career prior to that, I know I've experienced a lot of it and I've seen a lot of it subsequently that uh, uh, goalposts gets changed, uh, new uh, sometimes fad uh, objectives creep in and eventually people have just have to do to, to cope with too many things at the same time. The, the focus gets lost and and often resources diverted to new things that came up uh, in between without it having gone through that process where the whole organization has actually really reviewed it. It does not mean that Hoshin is not uh, capable of adopt, adopting to change. In fact, it is super uh, agile in making changes uh, because if, as business changes, you know, one of the documents that we often use is uh, similar to the, the SWOT. And most people know about the SWOT model. We actually use a DSWOT, uh, which, is, uh, which looks at potential disruptions that could come up. You know, we've, we've just in the last two years had a major disruption uh, that the whole world has been familiar with. It's interesting. We didn't have that as a disruption uh, element. We had a pandemic in my, my previous organization. We had that factored in as potential dis disruption. Oh, nice. That's the yeah. head. Yeah. And uh, we didn't know there was going to be one, but it came up and uh, we prepared for it in some way. Maybe nobody was prepared for this particular one in the fullest sense, but it does mean that you're not always, uh, you're thinking of potential issues and you prepare to be able to change when the need comes. Yeah. Wow, Dirk mentioned there that adapting to change is the key. That a previous organization he worked for had factored in a pandemic as a potential disruption. Crazy. COVID shocked us all and no doubt it's disrupted our businesses in many different ways. It's gonna be hard for many to recover and it's been hard also for me to keep up. C-suite planning and strategy deployment is key, including thinking about potential disruptions for the future. Let's call an end to this episode and cover more about embedding a culture of continuous improvement in part two. So thanks for a great episode, Dirk. Thanks for helping us create a better future. We'll chat again next week. Bye for now.